Greetings. Welcome to In Conversation with Trevor, brought to you by Heart and Soul Broadcasting Services. I go beyond the headlines and beyond the sensational. Today I'm in conversation with Anita Posh, a Bitcoin advocate and the executive director of Bitcoin for Fairness. Thank you very much, Trevor. I'm very honored to be here today, really. I'm, I'm always fascinated by how I meet people who end up sitting where you are sitting. So we met after you posted this tweet on Twitter. Let's share it with our viewers. And then a friend of mine, um, Stafford Massey, I let it meet your tweet and said, Trevor, hey, get in touch with uh, Anita and see if you can, you can talk to, to her. Just briefly tell us what it is that you did after you made, before you made that tweet. Okay, yeah, so um, we were traveling to the Eastern Highlands and I realized it's a very remote area, but still a lot of people are living there, agriculture and natural beauty. And I thought, oh, I want to try to send Bitcoin from here to South Africa because this is something that you, like standing there in this remote area, you can't really do that from Zimbabwe to South Africa. And uh, so I uh, sent some Bitcoin um, from my phone to Bitcoin Ikasi, which is a uh, project in South Africa that's also doing in Bitcoin. Cape Town, in, eh? I know they are in Mosul Bay. Mosul Bay, okay. Um, we can talk about them sure. later because it's a very interesting project. And they had it in seconds. Um, and so Bitcoin is borderless, permissionless, mm -hmm. and it was, it cost me nothing actually to send the money. And I could send an amount in Bitcoin, which is lower than five US dollars, which you can't do with most or even all financial services you have around here. Mm -hmm. So Bitcoin really enables you to send money almost for free anywhere in the world, which is great even more when you live in countries where you are like have financial uh, oppression and problems with banks and things like that. Mm. And so that's what we did and it was successful. And um, yeah. When, when you tweeted, um, uh, people, some people responded because you said you were the first one to send uh, yeah. Bitcoin from Zim. And somebody quickly said, no, my gardener actually sends Bitcoin yes. uh, to, to, to Zim. I didn't know whether to take them seriously or oh. not. What's, what's your response? I believe that they are serious. Okay. And of course, I know that people in Zimbabwe know about Bitcoin. And there are a lot of people who already use, uh, have used it or have been using it. Um, what I think was new was I sent it over the so-called Lightning Network, which enables micropayments to almost zero fees and I sent it from my own Bitcoin node, meaning I did more than just have it on, on a wallet and send it somewhere. So and I think that was the first of its kind. But of course, I know that a lot of uh, Zimbabweans already have been using Bitcoin, which I think is great. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that aspect of um uh, the Bitcoiners, is that what we call them? <laughs> yes, you can call them. Some Bitcoiners that I in Zimbabwe. Yeah. Um, th there's also Bitcoin mining in Zimbabwe. <laughs> Let's talk in the first instance about that community. In your view, how big is that community? Um, well, um, <laughs> I can say it from my own experience. So I came here the first time in 2020 mm -hmm. and did my first talk about Bitcoin and open blockchain technology um, and tried to foster a sort of a community here which is specialized on Bitcoin only and education because there are so many scams around. Mm -hmm. And um, so when I got back in uh, early 22, like in March this year, I met with some people who were already into Bitcoin. Um, someone came from Bulawayo to Harare to visit my talk. And then we started a WhatsApp group um, and it has grown from zero to 250 people now. Wow. And it's, it's a, there's no trading, no scams. So as soon as someone is joining the group and saying uh, you can get rich fast, they are kicked out. Yeah. And um, so now we have or had some meetups in Harare. There will be ones in Bulawayo. There was one in Gweru. Um, so it's growing. And I also, um, from talks to people who are using Bitcoin, I know that uh, with the pandemic, there was a huge increase in the use of uh, digital assets like mm. Bitcoin to send and receive money because people couldn't go out. They couldn't go to banks. I heard that in the year 2021, one trader alone traded six, no, seven million US dollars in value of uh, like Bitcoin and um, USDT. In Zimbabwe? In Zimbabwe. Wow. On the ground. Yeah. Peer to peer. Hmm. Yeah. 
Um, you, you also, as I was reading around, uh, you, you, you're talking about that set because of um, the, the uh, controls and that kind of stuff, people actually sometimes go around carrying cash to do a Bitcoin transaction in Zimbabwe. I, am I right? Am I yes. correct? Do you want to correct me and, and tell no, us no, exactly what's happening? No, you're completely, yeah. completely right. As far as I know, uh, there is a sort of a banking ban on Bitcoin. So banks are not allowed to interact with mm. it, but people are allowed. And it's an alternative money. It's like uh, exchanging goods with each other, you know. And so since there are, on the one hand, there's this ban of the Central Bank of Zimbabwe, and on the other hand, you have the international sanctions. Um, so international exchanges are not allowed to do business in Zimbabwe. And so there are not many exchange exchanges where people here can obtain or get Bitcoin, buy Bitcoin. Mm. But my, and, and, and so most of these trades happen in person. So you meet with someone you trust and this person gives you US dollars for your Bitcoin or the other way around. And I actually find this is very beautiful. It might, might sound to some people, oh, but we are excluded from the Bitcoin system. No, you're not. The great thing about that is basically that you have no restrictions. You don't need a, an ID to use Bitcoin. Mm. You don't need a bank account. And I think that is basically the thing which empowers people and gives them also privacy mm. because no one can take your Bitcoin away from you. But you can freeze a, a bank So a policeman can't arrest you and take a Bitcoin away from you? No, I mean, at gunpoint, yes. Or if they say, I throw you to jail, other, or you just you give me your private keys to your Bitcoin, of course, they can obtain it. But in general, on, on a level of, like, say, um, civilized uh, um, um, conversations with other people, or I mean, nobody can, can steal your Bitcoin, no. Mm. Because it's like cash in your pocket. It's only digital. Yeah. So I think on that point, let, let's help people at home and people like me. I'm sure you can tell from the questions I'm asking, asking that I'm totally ignorant. I have no idea about what I'm talking about. Help us break it down. What is Bitcoin? OK, I don't think uh, that uh, you have no idea, <laughs> but I can break it down. Yes, but break it down as quickly as you can so that people at home understand what it is that we're talking yes. about. Yes. Um, so um, Bitcoin is basically digital cash. You can imagine Bitcoin is not a coin. It's just something virtual. Um, and you have access to this virtual value through your wallet on your phone with your private key, the so-called seed. That was, that's a cryptographic method of enabling you to access data. Bitcoin is basically data that has a value on it. And so you can send it globally, borderlessly, permissionless. And you can use it peer to peer. That means you don't need a bank, you don't need to register, you don't have any transaction limits, um, you have low fees and there's no cooperation behind. You don't need to fill a form? No, nothing. You just need to either, if you have internet and a smartphone, you download a so-called open source self-custodial wallet like the Blue Wallet or the Moon Wallet or Wallet of Satoshi and then you can start. So if you have uh, relatives in the diaspora, for instance, they can <coughs> obtain Bitcoin there and send it to you. And in three minutes, you have the money. But I can't go into a shop and buy. Not yet. Not and yet. That's, that's the thing I'm trying to, to foster and encourage people yeah. to use Bitcoin as a medium of exchange. Because most um, Bitcoin, um, how should I say, influencers or so, they are speaking of, about the store of value and the speculation effect, how you can mm. uh, get invest in Bitcoin. Yeah? I'm speaking about using it as a pay means of payment that enables you to send fast, almost for free, and directly to uh, your relative without them having to go to Western Union, pay 30% fees, and then uh, maybe being robbed on the but, way. But help me, Anita, I I'm slow here. Mm. You really need to be slow with me. What's the point of me sending my relative Bitcoin if they can go to a shop 
and use Bitcoin to buy? Help, help me there. Yes. So, so for instance, they could um, got go to a website which is called Bitrefill and buy, uh, top up their phones with it. So you can top up your wow. Econet phone or your, how, how are the others called here? Econet? Econet and uh, Net One, Tel Net One. Net One, yeah. Tel mm -hmm. One, exactly. Mm -hmm. So you could send, um, you can directly basically send the, the, the telephone minutes to someone in Zimbabwe over Bitcoin. Using Bitcoin. Yes. Or I know from people who live in South Africa and have relatives in Malawi and uh, they are sending these mobile minutes to their mother in Malawi and mm -hmm. she sells the mobile minutes to her neighbors and that's the way how she gets the money. Mm -hmm. If you're in South Africa or other countries, like in the UK, you can buy so-called Bitcoin vouchers. Mm -hmm. uh, Azteco is the website. So you can basically buy there um, Bitcoin, but you only send, you only need to send the voucher code to your relative in Zimbabwe, and they can then obtain the Bitcoin and then go into one of these trusted WhatsApp groups and ask for people who would like to exchange mm. those Bitcoin to US dollars. Mm. Um, what's the connection, again, you need, really need to slow down here, what's the connection between Bitcoin and blockchain? So is there a connection? Yes, there is a connection, but many people believe that blockchain is the groundbreaking technology, which is, in my opinion, not true to my knowledge. So the blockchain is a database only in Bitcoin, that is storing all transactions that have been done since 2009. Blockchain, uh, sorry, blockchain, Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin transactions. Bitcoin blockchain mm -hmm. collects all the transactions in the right timely order. That's why Satoshi Nakamoto called it a time chain. He never spoke, he or they, because we don't know who it is, never spoke of blockchain. They only said time chain. And um, the main innovation that Satoshi Nakamoto made was there were a, a lot of attempts to build something like digital money already in the 90s. So it started with cryptography, a decentralized ledger and on and on and on. But all those people and experiments couldn't solve the problem of double spending. Mm. What does this mean? So when you have a PDF, a digital file, and you send it to someone else, you can say that's the original, but you can send 100 copies of the PDF wow. to someone else as well. So you're cheating them. And Satoshi Nakamoto solved this problem with the blockchain, with this database, um, that there is, can only ever be one digital Bitcoin be sent or spent. So you can't cheat. You can't copy your Bitcoin and say, now I have double the Bitcoin. And that's what, what he solved, they solved with the time chain or blockchain technology and the mining. And from that stems this idea that, that blockchain um, is in fact the technology that it will change or disrupt the internet. I agree in general that cryptography and decentralization will disrupt the internet, but I have a problem with the blockchain uh, What's word. What's the problem? What's the, the problem? Term. Was, so it's just because a term. It's, a, it's just a term, term that yeah, you have a problem It says with. a okay. lot of nothingness. Okay. Yeah? Right. Because um, all those blockchains or cryptocurrencies or different projects on top of blockchains work so differently. Mm. Um, there are different um, um, mechanisms how uh, mining works, like proof of stake, proof of work, and they all fall under blockchain it's a big it doesn't say anything mm. actually mm. and so i i have a little bit of problem with the term mm. but i believe in in the disruption that this will bring in the internet mm. yeah so let's talk about the disruption yeah um, you've you've brought in the subject yeah and this book um basically says this disruption is going to be huge yeah um and this disruption is basically going to torpedo mm the internet and I agree with it, with it in terms of um, the negatives associated with uh, the, in, the internet the uh, you know fake stuff copying stuff hate and all that kind of stuff hmm. and that blockchain the term that you don't like um, is, is going to come in and disrupt that that hmm. this book actually says uh, we're living th through uh, the end of the Google Times are actually here. The internet as we know it is faulty, 
and it's going to be disrupted in, to in Tokpilo. Talk to me about, about that. Yes, uh, yes, of course. So uh, let's go back a little bit in the history yeah, of the internet. You know, like I came uh, onto the internet in 1997. I had my first email at home and, and internet connection. And I was like, wow, blown away, you know. <laughs> and I thought, wow, this will change the world. Um, and I had the same feeling in 2017 when I rediscovered Bitcoin uh, and I understood that this will also change the world. And so at the beginning you had this internet or web 1.0. Yeah? That was the phase where we had um, websites where you just could interact with a website in reading it. You could maybe send an email to it, but it was basically just sending and pushing news or information. And then for around 2004, 5, 6, the so-called web.2.0 um, came along. And it was the rise of social media where we suddenly could comment. The blogging was, was coming up back then. You suddenly could comment and, and um, write down your opinion on certain pieces. And from that, Facebook and, and Twitter and all these uh, companies, which are centralized companies on top of an open internet. Um, so basically, the, the in the early 90s, people were basically um, enjoying the internet and saying, this will be the revolution. It opens communication for everyone. But then, because of financial reasons, business model reasons, these giants came along and they had a lot of money to put in from the beginning. They could suffer a lot of losses until they reached this massive um, um, importance scale, they, scale mm. they have today and are the biggest companies ever. The problem with them is they are completely centralized. They dictate what we see. They push ads upon us all the time. It's their model. Their model is to get as much data from us as possible. And then in the early 90s, there were the so-called cypherpunks. People like Adam Beck, for instance, who is one of the uh, inventors of Hashcash, which is used by Satoshi Nakamoto in Bitcoin, was an, an early privacy advocate and crypto cryptographer in these years. Um, and um, the USA wanted to forbid, or they basically banned cryptography. But mm. cryptography is only mathematics. And it's also freedom of speech in cryptography. Mm. And so they basically won this war. And um, um, the, the government in the US said, yes, um, encryption of data is a, I don't know how it's, uh, f a part of the First Amendment of the US. So a basic right. So in came these big com uh, companies. And the cypherpunks always said the goal of technology should be to honor the privacy of people as much as possible and just use this amount of code or software or data from the people that is really, really needed to function, to, to make this software work. And that is the basic idea behind Bitcoin. You have to think about that because those cypherpunks were those who wanted to create digital money and also um, save our privacy. And that is where Bitcoin comes in mm. and the web free what we see now, and that's what meant with this book, is the total decentralization of the internet, making it possible. We have um, websites like Keet.io, for instance. With Keet, you can send huge amounts of data peer to peer. Mm -hmm. It's like Bitcoin, you send it peer to peer. You don't need these companies anymore. And the, the greatest thing about that, about crypt cryptography and the private keys you hold to your own data, which is also what you do with Bitcoin is you can restrict like on a granular basis, who is allowed to see your data mm. and what are they allowed to do with it. So the disruption that the Bitcoin technology and cryptography is bringing is going from centralization, pushing ads on mm. you, um, mm. extorting you basically. Your, your personal professional journey is interesting to me because it essentially brings out your disaffection, your unhappiness with the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Having worked for 20 years, 22 years? Yeah, something like um, that. Uh, building websites and that kind of stuff. And then you decided that, no, I don't want to do this. Talk to us about that shift. Why you 
suddenly came to a point of saying, what I've been doing for 20 years is not right. I don't want to do this. Talk to me as about that. I wouldn't say that it yeah. wasn't right, but uh, I came to a point where I thought there must be something else. You know, I studied actually, I'm an urban planner, so I w always was interested in um, a good relationship, good uh, uh, economies on the ground, uh, neighborhoods, you know, that they are like have, have a good standing and, and are healthy and these kinds of things. And I also was always like interested in the people's economy. Um, so, like um, Occupy Wall Street in 2008, 2009. Fairness, justice, exactly. the small man. Yeah, exactly. So, fairness is, is something that is very important to me, and that's why I called my initiative Bitcoin for Fairness, because I realized then after 10, 22 years doing e commerce projects, like, you know, in Europe selling stuff that I thought people don't really need. and. Uh, this consumerism um, that we are in actually globally to sustain this economic system that we have at the moment, which is built on credit. And so as money is built on credit, we have to have ever growing growth. And this system brings us down. That's why we have climate problems mm. uh, and these kinds of things or why the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. You know, it's because money and property is in the hands of a few people. Mm. And coming back to my history, like then in 2017, I thought there must be something else. So it was 2016. Mm. And then I heard about Bitcoin again. I I'm going to hold you yes. there because the, you, you, you outline three very important things for me, which which um, uh, two you've touched on. You were unhappy with surveillance capitalism. Yes. yes. That's huge. I mean, that's what we're um, talking about. Yeah. Consumerism. Yes. We have the Chinese website. What is it called? Alibaba. Alibaba. That is good. That day where people go shopping, uh, Alibaba yeah. causes people to shop 20, 30 billion US dollars in yeah. one day. Yeah. Consumer, consumerism, uh, surveillance capitalism. The centralized nature of the of the mm -hmm, internet. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that grated with you. Those are the things that you are unhappy with. Yes. Please carry on. Yes, uh, the, the centralized internet, and that is what we were talking about before. Like this push of ads to you, the 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 stealing of your data, making money with it. You know, I wanted to to contribute to a bigger solution that will make all of that useless and. Uh, go into a new form of economy, which is a creator economy, a people's internet economy. Meaning, for instance, that with Bitcoin, you can now earn Bitcoin directly through your work as a podcaster, for instance. Or when you create content, you don't need a payment tool that takes another 5-10% from your money. You don't need to ask for permission. You just set up a so-called Bitcoin lightning address. And people from all over the world can send you money and you don't have to ask anyone for it. And, and that is how I believe that the creator economy um, will rise uh, on top of Bitcoin and crypto, cryptocurrencies where you can send money directly and without the bank. Mm. And this is going to change the world in so many aspects because it frees you also mm. from, from that you have to sell ads to make money as a YouTuber or mm. as a podcaster. You know why uh, Anita said um, um, you, you disagreed with this? Because essentially, this is what you've been doing all your life. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what you've been doing for 20 years, you, you, you woke up and say no, there's got to be something else. That, that shift is huge, Anita. That's what I'm trying to say to you. But what's your pushback? Yes, exactly. I mean, I was a big fan of Facebook at the beginning. I mean, at go. the beginning, I said I dislike it, but then I used it because everyone was using it. And I realized I have to use it if I want to, to uh, market my, my mm. services, for instance. So I taught people on how to use uh, social media, business people on how to use social media. But then I realized, OK, now with Bitcoin, I really have the chance to do uh, what, what I'm in a way maybe supposed to. To do. I'm going to put you on the, on, the, on, the, on the spot and I want to do that so that we help people out there uh, get where you're coming from. So you taught business people to use social media. Mm -hmm. You're now teaching business people to do what? To use Bitcoin. 
<laughs> not social you, media. Not social media, no. Exactly, that's my point. <laughs> it's that shift that I want to bring out yes. and where it is coming from. Oh, it's a huge shift because uh, all I know about the financial system, about how money is created, uh, about economy um, and these things, I all learned that from 2017 on uh, because I was interested in Bitcoin and I wanted to find out can I trust it? How does it work? What is the technology behind? Uh, what, I, what is the philosophy behind? And so, it, yes, it's a huge shift and it's uh, empowering, empowering people on another level. Before with social media, I thought about empowering people through free communication. And that's also empowering. Mm. And what is now pe empowering people is the internet of money mm. that you can send value like an email. Mm. You can send value on social media. There, there is, th th that's a hugely important point. I just want us to, to zero in on that. You say Bitcoin might be our only tool to secure the human right to privacy and freedom of transaction. One. Two. It's a medium of liberation for billions of people and a defense mechanism for privacy. Mm -hmm. That's a big thing to say. Unpack that for us. One of the human rights in the Declaration of Human Rights is freedom of speech. So if you send money to, let's say, a political party or someone else, then you express your opinion with sending money. And in today's system, this opinion can be cut down. So you can, if you send money to a political party that some government doesn't like, they will freeze your accounts. Happened, for instance, in Nigeria with the Nigerian Feminist Coalition. They were supporting the end SARS uh, protests in 2019, I think. And the Central Bank of Nigeria froze their bank account. They couldn't get any donations anymore. And they reminded themselves of, ah, there's this new technology, it's called Bitcoin. Let's install a, a BTC Pay server where we can get donations from abroad again. And they got it again, and they were able to support mm. the demonstrators again. We've seen that in Ukraine too. Ukraine has used Bitcoin technology to fundraise to fight the war in a big way. Exactly. And there were also a lot of people were able to flee the country with their Bitcoin possessions or cryptocurrency possessions, which you usually can't do because the ATMs are either uh, empty or the banks are closed in such a crisis like a war and mm. you can't get money out of the bank anymore. But if you have the keys to your Bitcoin, you can just go across the country, mm. you can migrate, you can flee and Is take your money Bitcoin with you. Is the Bitcoin key like a password? Yeah, it's something, it's a sort of password. Okay. So it's called the seed and usually it's about 12 English words in a certain order. You need to memorize, not memorize, you, you need write to them down write somewhere. them down on a sheet of paper not on your computer or so, because that can be hacked. And these 12 words will always give you access to the money, because the money is not in your wallet on your phone, it's on the Bitcoin blockchain in the database. So with that seed, you can uh, basically access the value you own on the Bitcoin blockchain. It's a little bit like if you have your password for mm. Gmail, mm -hmm. your emails are not on your computer, they are on Gmail server, but you can access this with, with the password. Mm. So let's go to the next point. Yes. So you're saying uh, bit, it's a medium of liberation for billions of people and a defense mechanism for privacy. Yes. Talk to us about that. So uh, around 2 billion of people worldwide are without bank accounts because they either are too poor and not interested, interesting for the banks, they are too far away from banks, um, or they don't have an ID. So these 2 billion peoples are ex people are excluded from our financial system. They can't use money uh, to store value or to send it or to, to build a company around it or things like that. And um, with Bitcoin being permissionless, everyone can access it. And at the moment, like there are nine African countries where you um, don't even need the internet to use Bitcoin. Uh, there's a system called Machankura A333. You can send Bitcoin like mobile money. Using USSD, U is that Using it? USSD, exactly, mm -hmm. yes. And I think this is huge and people don't get it yet, yeah? Because it's, it's also, we are, we are still very at the beginning of these Bitcoin technologies, you know? 
this is all coming and so it includes also these people because they just need a feature phone and a uh, let's say tail one or econet um, um, phone minutes mm. line yeah and they can use bitcoin and so also do you know which, which, do you know which these nine countries are the nine african countries which are do, oh, do you be able to uh, name it's south them? south africa mm -hmm. zambia kenya help us here with how to install a bitcoin secure wallet on your smartphone <laughs> okay how, so can you do that yes of can course. you do that now yes how long will it take um five minutes you know five either. minutes to do that but you've got a video um that, that that explains that but you can explain it to us now can you yes yeah, so there's one thing Fantastic. i wanted to say we have this small folder on our website um it's bffbtc.org okay we'll find it oh yeah. mm -hmm. flyer and everyone can download it basically for free of course and it it uh, explains the basic principles of bitcoin and it also has a sort of a guide how to install a wallet on your phone so um you basically um if you have mobile data and internet, you can download a wallet like the Blue Wallet, for instance, or Moon Wallet, which is free in mm -hmm. the Play Store um, on your phone. And then when you open it up, it also um, it immediately asks you to write down the seed words. You have to keep them secure. And from there, you can start. You can so go by to the receive. Time, by, uh, after this, you can teach me how to do that. Of course. And I'll have a, 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 a Bitcoin wallet. Yes. Awesome stuff. And we will play that video to share that uh, that you did mm -hmm. um, for 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 our viewers to get a sense of how they can play around with their phone and install Bitcoin.
me now about your passion for human rights. Yeah, I mean, I think this one is a result of a my my grandfather uh, and mother's education about the Second World War and um, how 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 fast powers can change, and your political friend is suddenly your enemy, and which, which implication that has on your life. So that's one thing, and the other thing. I mean, I'm I'm a lesbian, you know. So and when I grew up 20 years ago, it wasn't possible for us to marry or to have children um, with with a female partner or so. So, and you know, every day I see accounts of where uh, uh, gay people are killed or lesbians are hanged in the Iran and things like that. So up until this point today, this is affecting me of course because uh, it's not not we don't do we don't do any harm to anyone you know and uh, it's a great unfairness and i i really suffer from that mm -hmm. and so i think i understand the the unfairnessness so how is this word mm. um um that um is occurring to to many many other people on other accounts you know um marginalized communities marginalized communities minorities Females, women worldwide, mm. we still earn less. We we don't have the same rights. There are still 75 countries in the world that uh, don't allow women to inherit or own property. This is also something that Bitcoin could solve because mm. you only need a phone and nobody needs to know and that yet, you have that. And yet when we were starting off air, you were saying that uh, you have observed that the number of people, number of women using mm. Bitcoin is very low. And we were sharing with you that uh, our viewers out there, 85% of our viewers are men and 15% mm. are, are women. We're quite trying to understand why is this? Why is the use and understanding of Bitcoin so low amongst women? Do, 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 do you have any insights on that? Yeah, I think it's uh, basically stereotypes um, that we learn when we grow up. You know, a, a girl has to play nice and, and keep the family together and... Um, technology and all those interests are more like seen in the boys. And this is something that um, is perpetuated until late, until we are older. And so I think Bitcoin is a technology, for instance, it has to do with mathematics, cryptography, finances, um, and, and money, and the internet, and computers, and these are all areas in which women are underrepresented. And I always wanted to change that, being a woman, standing there and saying, hey, you can do that too, yeah? Mm. And it will help you, um, it will liberate you. And so that's the reason why I believe that there are less women. Um, they are just not um, motivated from outside to do it. Mm. They are motivated to, to care for the family and, and uh, be not loud and uh, yeah. Mm. So you, you talk about the inspiration for your passion for human rights coming from your parents and their experience. You are a lesbian. Tell us about where you were born and where you were educated. Where oh, were you born? Yeah. I was born or I'm, I was born in Austria mm -hmm. um, 52 years ago. <laughs> and um, so I went to school there. Uh, I went to university there and spent basically my whole life there. But I always had an interest, I don't know why, but in the African continent, maybe also because my one of my aunts, she was traveling Africa like in the 70s. And I was very impressed with that. And um, and I saw that also then then Bitcoin really has the biggest use case in on the African continent or the South American continent, where the problems with money are the highest, and also where we have the highest number of our authoritarian leaderships. You know, we have globally 54 percent of all people have to suffer or live under authoritarian rulers. Mm. And when I realized that Bitcoin can basically topple dictators. I knew that this is elementary for us, for human rights, for us as people, because it that ca doesn't come from me, that comes from a human rights activist um, from Eritrea. And she says, um, if we all were to start using Bitcoin, which we hold in self-custody, the governments could not steal the money from us anymore, so we would dry them out. Mm. They, they can't extract the value mm. from us mm. anymore. Mm. 
And I find this is really changing, life changing. And if people were to get that, I'm, I'm here to basically bring that um, um, message. You know, and and what's wh why Zimbabwe? We've been to Zimbabwe, you've been to Zambia, uh, and you would you you were saying you're going to share with us what ECASI is it, doing. Mm. Talk about those projects in the first instance, active your, your what you're doing in Zimbabwe, what you've been doing in Zambia, and the ECASI project. I looked at them on Twitter. Very interesting young young people doing interesting things in uh, in uh, yeah. uh, Mosul Bay. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So um, what I and my friends at Bitcoin for Fairness are trying to do uh, is bring Bitcoin knowledge to these places here um, to share, like bring also infrastructure. So like uh, Zambia and Bitcoin Ikasi, I brought a so-called a device, which is a Bitcoin and Lightning full node, which makes the, the Zambians and the Bitcoin Ikasi people really a part of the Bitcoin network. You know, it's coming from the US and from Europe. Um, it's a little bit like the internet. People used it there at the beginning and it trickled down to, to African nations later and it's the same here now. And um, so with bringing these devices, we enable the people there to have access to this groundbreaking technology. And so what I also do is we're doing workshops and um, fostering the setup of meetups so that I'm not coming here to tell people what to do. I, when they ask me how to use this technology safely, I tell them and I try to educate the educators mm -hmm. so that people here themselves can uh, build their own communities. And because I only think that is sustainable. It's mm -hmm. not sustainable to come here, uh, throw money around and then go again, you know. And so in Zambia, we did a meetup, we did a workshop for journalists. We had 10 journalists coming to a day long workshop and um, we told them what, uh, what Bitcoin is, how to identify scams. We also downloaded, bit, downloaded a Bitcoin wallet and did some transactions with each other. So they now know how to use it. And um, then there is the Bitcoin Ikasi project, which started one and a half years ago. And it's basically uh, a surf school um, owner who said, I also want to contribute here. And he started 10 years ago to invite the children from the Ikasi, the township, mm, township yeah. um, in Mosul Bay to, to learn uh, surfing for free. Because he su says, and that's true, it's also a school of life yeah, because you have to have discipline mm. and uh, perseverance and things like that. And then when he discovered Bitcoin, he s thought, that would be great actually for the people here as a tool to empower themselves financially and not being dependent on the rent anymore. So um, he started to share his Bitcoin knowledge with his coaches. So the surf coaches are young men from the township and they now have this Bitcoin knowledge and then they have a teacher there. They mm. do like school education and also teach the children about Bitcoin. And the thing is now that the surf school is paying the surf guides uh, in Bitcoin. Wow. And they themselves in their own neighborhood um, onboarded 10 of 17 shops, these small informal shops to accept Bitcoin. So the guides can go there and spend their money there on daily goods. Wow. And now even it's possible to buy vouchers for pick and pay and for checkers mm. with Bitcoin. Mm. So they can use the Bitcoin they earn and go to pick and pay and shop Spend gro it. Gro groceries. Yes. Yeah. The, the, I suppose as, as you're talking uh, in, in terms of um, financial inclusion, mm -hmm. um, it, it's got a huge impact there. Definitely, that's the hugest impact I can think of because you don't need an ID, you don't need to be already rich, you don't need to have any status, you can use it, uh, any gender, any color of people, you know, everyone can use it. And so for me, it's the most inclusive tool. And the, the thing, the reason why that is, is also the reason that Satoshi Nakamoto is not around anymore and Bitcoin is not a company. So nobody, no state actor, can go and say, close down that tool because you are a company and I force you to close it down. And this can't happen with Bitcoin. And that is what it's meant with it's unstoppable. Mm. Even if governments say Bitcoin is illegal here, people will use it. This is happening in Nigeria, for instance. 
In Nigeria, it's not illegal to use Bitcoin, but um, the banks are also advised to not use it. So it's a banking ban, basically. But, but the adoption, people are going on. The adoption it. is going woo, you know, because everybody who is using it for the first time will see how much it uh, basically empowers themselves, mm. what they can do with it. Mm. And so, so I believe. Th let's yeah. use me as an example. Mm -hmm. You're going to teach me mm -hmm. how to download mm -hmm. a wallet. Mm -hmm. Where do I get that money from? Where, where will I get the Bitcoin? For instance. You I'm going to earn it. it. Yeah, you can, you can set up a so-called lightning address. It looks like an email address, but it's basically an email address where one can send you Bitcoin to. It's very easy to do. So I'm, I can do some work on the yes. internet and stuff and somebody pays me? Yes, exactly. And that's what a lot of people already are doing in Zimbabwe. I know of Zimbabweans who have been working online and earning Bitcoin for their work from abroad for years now. So um, that's basically, and this is also something where we are very at the beginning. Mm. It's coming up. You can. So guys uh, out there, by the end of the show, I'm going to have a Bitcoin. What do you call it? A lightning address. A lightning address and a wallet. You can, you can send me money yes. when I do share the address. The, the other thing that you shared with me, which I found fascinating, is that there are people in Zimbabwe right now who are doing Bitcoin mining. Mm -hmm. It's happening? It's happening, yes. Is it a big community or it's one uh, or two people? No, I mean, we don't have small. to disclose we, the names no, because we, we don't want to, to endanger them. But exactly. that's an interesting thing. So the thing that happened was when I was here in March, um, I was like, yeah, sharing what we are doing on Twitter and other media. And I, I connected two guys with each other. One is in the UK diaspora and another one is a Bitcoiner. And um, this UK guy uh, wanted to start Bitcoin mining on his farm here mm. in Zimbabwe, where he has solar energy. Mm. And this other guy, um, which I interconnected with him, they, uh, he said, I'm going to donate a few old mining machines. Hmm. These are specialized computers. computers that mine Bitcoin. So they are part of the security of Bitcoin, of the network in a way. So they, this guy really sent those uh, machines. And um, the Zimbabwean guy um, here in the country uses his solar energy on the farm now to mine Bitcoin basically for free because he has that solar power in, in excess. Mm -hmm. So excess energy, it's for free. So I know he, he said he's mining about $20 a day mm -hmm. value in value, mm -hmm. um, which is huge actually really? for this small um, computer. Yeah, it's only like six computers, you know. So it's an experiment, but it goes to show that you can do it when you have hydropower, for instance, or solar power. And there's one thing I want to say to that. Um, it empowers not only people who have small scale farms and excess energy. Bitcoin brings self sovereignty to the individual by the fact that you hold the keys to your money. You are the sole owner of your money if you do it right, not on an exchange. Um, and on the other hand, it enables self sovereignty for whole countries and nation states. That's what I also told the Zambian journalists. If countries here, which have excess hydropower, were to start Bitcoin mining, because you only need the machines and the knowledge, but then you have this cheap electricity um, that you, m in most cases, also can't send far across. Yeah? So you can use it there. Then you can basically mine your way into a Bitcoin reserve. Mm. So you... you you uh, change your natural resource and make b basically mine Bitcoin from it. It's like, <laughs> like gold, but only you, 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 you're mining new Bitcoin. Using a computer and using energy. Exactly, um, that hydro. you have. Yes, exactly. Uh, green energy. And then you have that. And if you hold it for 10 to 20 years, I, I can't, can't say it will happen because then I would be a scammer. Yeah. But I think the price will go up as it did from zero to 20,000 now, you know. Mm. So you, you, you are not at the mercy of others then. So you create a reserve of Bitcoin. You don't have to indebt yourself again with other countries, which I think is a, a devil's circle, mm. you know. These countries here, they always get new credit from the IMF or from the Chinese or from the Americans. And then basically those um, 
uh, countries own African countries. Anita, I asked my friend in, who is in Johannesburg, South Africa, uh, Stafford Massey, uh, at, the Gip, at the Gibbs Business School, if um, uh, Bitcoin could solve Zimbabwe's economic problems, and this is what he had to say. Bitcoin could do things for Zimbabwe that's extraordinary. Um, it really, really could. It could allow for new financial instrumentation uh, in a way that um, you know you can't even imagine. I think if someone had to ask me, like, what was Bitcoin built for? The formal economy, like you and I, that have bank accounts and cards. No, it was built. But, but Bitcoin built for people that have cash and that cash infrastructure. You know, no, I think like like even cash is quite intricate, and the structures built around it on a social basis. The way um, a shabin works, where I grew up. Uh, the way a stock file works, it's very really structured. I think Bitcoin is not for the informal economy or informal economy. It's for this, like what I call the third economy. Mm. And it's a, it's a view that I don't have right now. But it's imagine giving a guy two hours outside of Shenzhen that has, he has got a mobile phone, he's got no access to fiat currency, mafia state, uh, etc. So he's like, what could he do with this? What could that guy, you know, an hour outside of Arari do with this? That's going to be interesting. He'll create new financial instrumentation. So my, I would encourage leadership in Zimbabwe to take a look at it the same way El Salvador's looked at it. I think make it legal tender. I think um, uh, regulate it in a friendly way. Create a tax framework around it. Um, be careful of the crazy stuff. I think focus on Bitcoin. Yeah. Bitcoin and Lightning um, and the wallets associated with that. I mean, you could, you could switch on cross-border payments instantaneously. You could create businesses that have inflows um, and you could create a whole new taxation paradigm with, for the government. I mean, it, it could solve Zimbabwe's capital problem. So what, what do you think? Can Bitcoin solve Zimbabwe's? You, 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 you've come here, you looked at our monetary situation, you looked at the controls, you looked at the shortage of foreign cu of currency and everything else. Can Bitcoin solve our problems? Um, it definitely can help solve individuals' problems. And on a nation state level, I mean, you had or have had a lot of problems, problems with inflation. We know that. And um, on the other hand, it's also like new currencies are coming up here and there. And then suddenly your US dollar account is exchanged into a one to one Zimbabwean dollar. And they tell you ah, it will stay the same value. But now we are what one to seven fifty or something. And so this will happen over and over again. And so Bitcoin is basically a neutral money since there no one can decide or change the maximum of amount of Bitcoin that will be in existence because that is what monetary inflation is. The government is printing money to extract value from the people. And then I guess um, they exchange it to US dollars and uh, buy themselves something, you know. Mm. Um, a Bitcoin also uh, they can, can't do this. With they Bitcoin. can't do this with your Bitcoin because you have the password, the seed. It's like cash, you know. Um, and uh, the other thing is corruption. Um, Bitcoin is private and open or transparent at the same time, which sounds crazy, but it works like that. So you don't, as you don't associ associate your name or email or um, ID with Bitcoin, it's private because it's pseudonymous. You can mm. spend it and nobody knows that it's coming from you. But on the other hand, um, if you want to uh, take uh, uh, governments into a, not account, how you to say that you audit, you want to audit budgets, for instance, you can do that with the Bitcoin blockchain very easily because you see where the money is going. You can follow the money so they can't run away with it anymore. Um, the, the, the diverse governments um, stealing from the people. And um, so I believe it can, in a way, solve a lot of people's problems here with money. Mm -hmm. um, also, I hope that many countries around the world will see that Bitcoin is basically an internet protocol that enables exchange of value. And as such, it can't be um, influenced by governments or people who have lots of it money. It can't be hacked. No, it can't be hacked. It can't be, the code can't be changed without a global consensus where everyone who is using the network would agree on it. 
So if there ever is disagreement about the future code of Bitcoin, this has happened like in 2017, for instance, then you suddenly see uh, a so-called hard fork, meaning the code uh, is not the same anymore. You then had Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin. And um, <laughs> one of the guys who is cited here, Greg Wright, he's one of those Bitcoin uh, SV founders. Mm -hmm. um, um, he, he says he is Satoshi Nakamoto, but he can't prove it. So, um, yeah. Um, so there is this possibility if someone were to want to change the code, they can do it. But I think then it will split again. So you have two versions of the Bitcoin software, basically. Mm. So I think that it's the best money that could be used as a global standard of base money mm. for all countries because it can't be influenced. Because now we have the hegemony of the US dollar. Everyone mm -hmm. wants the US dollar. Everyone has to use it because it's still connected to the petrol, mm -hmm. pe uh, petrol industry. And therefore it has its power. But this hegemony is also crumbling. And how nice would it be if all countries would agree on a neutral money standard that is Bitcoin and not the US dollar, the yen or the ruble mm -hmm. and all these currency wars because we have currency wars. Every country is trying to have, uh, like have more exports. They change the value of the money. And also with Bitcoin, central banks and bankers and politicians could not influence the monetary, um, how is it called, protocol or mm -hmm. the, the monetary standard anymore. They can't inflate Bitcoin. They can't wow. make more of it. I, I, I've got thousand questions you're talking right now, but most of them are coming from ignorance. <laughs>
And I believe that Bitcoin is a tool that can smallen the gap between the, 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 the global south and the north, you know, the wealth gap. Mm. The earlier you people here, sorry that I say it that way, start learning and using Bitcoin, the, the faster you adopt it and the faster you will overtake the people in Europe or in the US who still say, I don't see the need, I don't see the use case, because there we have banks that are quite okay mm. working. Mm. Now we also have 10% inflation in Austria, you know? Mm. And so um, I really believe that Bitcoin um, has here the, the, the best or uh, makes the mo most sense potential. for people, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. biggest potential um, to, to make you, let's say, more independent and also, um, I mean, this, this symbol stands for empowerment, in my opinion. I was a little, <laughs> I thought, should I really use it? Um, because it's Africa, but it's also valid for South mm. America, you know. But then I thought, yeah, my work at the moment is in African countries mm. and it's a sign of solidarity, actually. Okay. Any books that you would recommend to our book-loving audience out there? Any books to help them understand Bitcoin and particularly the connection between human rights and yes. Bitcoin? If there are any books mm -hmm. that you could recommend, so, please, for our book-loving viewers. Yes, so as we said, the uh, Internet of Money series by Andreas Antonopoulos. If you're more into the technical uh, ideas and the software behind, then it's also Mastering Bitcoin by Andreas Antonopoulos for developers. Um, and then I would say the Little Bitcoin book um, is also on a very, how shall I say, understandable... Who, who wrote that book? Alena Vranova, Alex Gladstein, and two other people. Okay. Alex Gladstein is also a, a human rights activist, and um, so they, they speak from that yeah. perspective. Yeah. I al also speak about that in my book, and I recently made a keynote um, about how Bitcoin is enforcing human rights. Mm. So. Anita, this is uh, a conversation that could take um, another year. <laughs> Or more, yeah. um, uh, and because this, we, we we are. I get a sense that we are at that space where the disruption of the internet, blockchain, Bitcoin is happening. I'm not an expert, but I sense that there's something there's something happening. And this book here, which I'm recommending to those people who are interested in 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 in, in reading and deciding whether we are at that space, you know, when when we're excited about. Emails in 1919, when was it? Five, seven. Thereabout. And we, you know, people thought, oh, it wouldn't last. Uh, and yeah. here we are. And, and this guy has wrote, written quite a number of books. He's an investor, he's somebody who's quite wealthy and has been very influential within the tech space. And his views are very interesting. We don't have to agree with him, but it's, it's pretty thought provoking. Anita, thank you so much for sparing the time to come and share your insights here. I'm, I'm sure this episode is going to start a lot of conversations about <laughs> around around Bitcoin, um, the Bitcoin mining, uh, connection to human rights is going to be exciting. Some people are going to be upset that we're talking about Bitcoin <laughs> helping topple governments, but uh, such is the nature of uh, freedom of expression, isn't it? Exactly. Um, Anita, thank you so much for coming through and spending time with us. Allow me to turn over now, Anita, to our viewers who are all over the world who follow us. Remember, we are out on YouTube every Monday at 7 a.m. Central African time to ensure that you don't miss out on any of these quality conversations such as one I've had with Anita here. Please uh, click onto this button and subscribe. Remember to like, remember to share. We also have developed podcasts um, uh, and we sit on all major podcast platforms for your listening pleasure. We have created a website for, your, for, for, for you to, to scroll, look, rather explore the kind of content that we've, we've got on our, on our website. Visit our website and see the content that we've, quality content that we've built over the years. Thank you for your support. Until next time.